Chris with Implied Music, and this is actually future me, that what we're about to see is a guest lecture that I did at Washington University at St. Louis. Um, Robert Morgan, the theater arts uh, professor there, invited me to do a Zoom lecture to his class of technical theater students. It was a, a lively conversation. I wanted to cover some functional, fundamental things with them, and they had some great questions. So I just thought I would show it to you guys. Well, I hope you enjoy it. All right. Um, so uh, it really gives me great pleasure, actually, to have um, a, a dear friend and colleague, um, a designer, talented designer, talented composer, uh, Chris Houston, join us all the way. You're in Berkeley, yes? Berkeley. I'm in Berkeley. Nice to see you guys. It's a pleasure to be in uh, where, St. Louis, right? Well, first of all, I had a chance to look at the questions that um, were aggregated over the course of the past few days. And it's clear to me from those questions that many of you have spent a little time on uh, either my personal website, that is to say Implied Music's website, or my absurdly and surprisingly fairly successful now YouTube channel, which I use primarily as kind of a music tutorial space, but which has a lot of, you know, theater components as well. And I guess what I want to start off saying today and then try to address some of those questions is this something that i'm sure you know now because you're in the long grass with winter's tale which is that as a sound designer any kind of designer or a participant in theater what you're essentially doing is deeply collaborative it relies on the person in the foxhole next to you and at some level I know that for myself, when I've been doing theater, I'm kind of doing it, not for the imagined audience member, but I'm doing it for Mark. We did Streetcar, right? And so Streetcar Named Desire is this kind of like energizing, kind of beautiful um, play that just, there's a million ways to, to tackle it. And I didn't exactly know what to do. And one of the first things that happens in, a, in the first design meeting is you 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 come in and and see a, a set mock-up a small model and previous to that moment i hadn't really you know hadn't really understood what was going to be happening and for me and then when i saw that model it all just sort of came together it's crucial to rely on the input from designers directors and everybody on that you know who's got boots on the stage there um, the lighting designer sits right beside you when you're the sound designer in a show and you, you, you better get along. <laughs> Chris, because... I, have, I have to add that it, that it goes both ways. When we've worked together, you're one of few sound designers that will send me samplings of cues of music you're thinking about. Maybe even it's just pre-show music, but right. I turn that on and I work right. on the project at the same time and it, it sort of puts you in a mood for the play. It's a truly collaborative art form. It really is. It, it, it's, it's collaborative and it's complicatedly collaborative. It's not just like, you know, working together at Kroger's. It's, it's, it's more like being in a family. I know that for myself, and I'll just talk a little bit about like my earliest theatrical experiences. Uh, you know, I was, a uh, you know, in musicals when I was a teenager and and I basically thought of myself as a musician who could act and stuff. And, and it, it, I, for me, I found in theater, and this may be true for you guys as well, a kind of a family that wasn't like my actual sort of family of origin, a family that was perhaps a little more accepting of some of the peculiarities and unique qualities that I had. And I could sort of find my way into a identity that was really powerful. And I think that theater functions that way for us. This is kind of all preamble to what does a sound designer actually do? I'd like to tell you briefly like what my process is. So almost any designer's first step is the text. And for most plays, the text is going to be my God. I go to it and I'm looking for a number of things right away. The first set is a sense of time and place. And of course, music and sound can really create that in a way that is efficient and economical. I can um, create a sense of being at the seashore without us having to build a bunch of rocks and water, you know? 
I can bring in birds or create even a sense of claustrophobic, you know, deep in the crypt kind of energy by just using a small amount of reverb on a stage mic. These kinds of things are very powerful emotionally. And as I go through the script the very first time, I'm taking notes about that. We're also really concerned about the historical precedence of the text itself. So a dramaturg's input on the text, on the history of the author's intent and their background plays a role for me. It really does. We may choose to put it aside. All that stuff happens in my head alone first. And I write up a sound plot and some ideas and bring it to the director. And they usually say, way too ambitious. Can you dial this back? Can you dial this back? Can you dial this back? And that's what I want to hear. I want my ideas to be too much almost every time. I want to be pared back so that I can focus, right? Well, once that happens, my next step, and this very, and this is, was, was a question we got, it, I, I began to ask myself, well, how much of this is musical and how much of this is what we would conventionally call sound design? And in sound design, we have a couple of categories. There, there's um, natural sound that's, you know, just part of the world of the play, like what you'd expect to see looking at these people in that place. The telephone may have to ring, the dog may have to bark. It may need to come from a very specific location. All that stuff was kind of all I did the first few years. I was a sound designer because no one cared really about me as a composer at all. And so it was a question of sourcing material. Um, finding ways to get a speaker to a certain location, getting ways to make it happen in time. In my career, because I'm 64, I went from using just reel-to-reel -reel tape, went from dig you know that to little mini disc recorders, and then finally digital audio. And now we use, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, and if anyone isn't, you should be. Almost everybody I know uses QLab. A digital audio workstation that's essentially a kind of a timeline cue sheet. And QLabs become like sort of like the central nexus of everything, right? Terrifically powerful program, which can actually be the center of everything. And that's super powerful for folks at, at your level. Like when you leave school, you're going to be doing small stuff initially, and you may well find yourself not you're having a big budget, you may not have a lot of gear. QLab has a free stereo iteration that is absurdly powerful. Here's QLab. Um, Q, QLab looks like um, an old fashioned, mm, like iTunes playlist or something like that. And um, how big is this on the screen? Is it big enough so that you can really see it or should yeah. I? Oh, we definitely the... can, yeah. Okay, good, all right, great. So as I highlight something, it's ready to play and and the audio files are only one kind of cue I can have and you can see a little speaker icon right here. And down below I also have fader icons and that can fade and stop a cue. Um, whether a cue plays and then goes on to something else is uh, controlled over here with this little cute icon and basically for any given cue I can set up three or four events. So for my production of Cyrano last year, I wrote a piece of music. There's the audio file sitting there down below, you can see it. And I wanted it to play, I'm just gonna start it and hopefully it won't be too loud. Now I'm gonna speak over it. Can you hear me speaking? Super. It's playing this piece of audio and at a certain point, determined over here, this piece of audio will roll forward into the next cue, which is essentially, you know, street sound, people moving around, etc. And this is kind of like the classic let's get into the show cue. I built that street scene as one audio file and sent it to actually separate speakers on the stage. And when the stage manager is ready, I can take Q4 just by hitting the space bar and it will fade and stop everything and move to a different piece of music as you hear. And then when everything is ready, I hit Q5. And the show goes on in exactly that way again and again and again. Now, 
uh, this particular version of the show is set up for just stereo because I did it, you know, kind of on my laptop. In the theater, the actual outputs, devices and levels can go to as, as many audio outs as you have on your device. And what it means is I can spread speakers around the stage, embed small speakers in set pieces, create uh, three-dimensional um, sounds which begin in one place and travel to another. During the time that I've been making theater sound and music, the expectation of audiences and directors has changed so much uh, from essentially, oh, it would be nice if the dog could bark from stage left, wow, he did it, to I want it to be like a movie. Many sound designers will um, take an approach that you could just describe as um, um, you know, an accumulation of sounds from various sources. And there may not be composers themselves. They, they find the correct sounds, they edit the sounds, they find the, what feels like correct music, they edit the music and then build that way. And I've done shows like that, even as a composer, there may be a, a very good reason to use a Bruce Springsteen track. You can get into trouble, you know, using unauthorized music, <laughs> but I, the, here, I've been doing, I'm just, ugh, I probably shouldn't say this. I've been doing this for like at this point now, 45 years, and no one's ever come after me. But, you know, it could shut a show down. And I, while I don't condone, um, you know, sort of music piracy, I think that there's an argument to be made for a certain amount of fair use in artistic expression. It's become conventional. I, I, I'm old. And so I have a different sort of perspective on it, perhaps. And I'm, but I'm conscious that my, young stu my younger students and the folks I work with right now have a much more loose relationship with copyright. Listen, let me show you another thing, because I think it's super useful for us as um, uh, sound designers or anyone working yeah, in sound and speaking directly to the idea of a democratized source of stuff, check out Freesound. So freesound.org is a resource which if you don't know about as a sound designer or just a designer or theater maker, I think you probably should take a look. I actually did a quick search for wash, <laughs> wash you. <laughs> Right. So I wanted to know what kind of sounds would come up for me. And of course, you know, most of it is you a lot know, of dishes being washed. A lot of dishes being yes. washed. Exactly. <laughs> but but the 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 remarkable amount of material and it's crowdsourced from designers, uh, audio enthusiasts, uh, amateurs and professionals all over the world, literally, the amount of it is really quite remarkable. And these are, you know, wave files that um, Shall we just hope for the best and hear what this shaking washing machine sounds like? That's Some good. of them are just really great sounding. Somebody's done some work on this, I can tell. Looks like they've uh, added some reverb and the stereo effect is awesome, right? I mean, I got to say, I just love that. Thank you so much. And I, I'll, I'll figure out what I need and I'll just come into Freesound, which uses a Creative Commons license. You can use any of this stuff with proper attribution. And, and uh, like I've, uh, it's, it's a major resource for me. You may, if you wish, spend a lot of money on um, audio effect libraries. And maybe that's the best choice for you, especially if you're doing a, a movie or a video piece that has a big budget. But free sounds incredibly useful for us as theater makers, especially as theater makers at local levels. Jimmy, do you mind if I read your question? Yeah. Um, you said, I love your website design uh, and videos on YouTube. After seeing a few of your videos, which are mainly educational, I was wondering if you will use these not this knowledge to decompose other music you listen to in your daily life. Here's the thing about music. It is magical and it continues to be magical no matter how much you know about it and it's useful magic right it's one of those kinds of magic that it's like it's that rough magic which we just use all the time so i don't know how many times in my life i've heard a piece of music and my thought has been what previously unexplored combination of chords and sounds can that composer have touched on to get me to feel this thing that I'm feeling and I'll so I'm just be having an emotional experience with it and I'll sort of like 
step back and achieve a certain amount of detachment. And I'll realize that it's the most common chord progression everywhere, right? There is something absurdly magical about the, the commonplace in music. And it, it speaks to its power to enter our hearts, bypassing this assembly, right? Where it's all brain and thinking and kind of like create a kind of a open place here. So it goes right to the heart. This is what I love about music in theater or film. It opens up an emotional corridor, which other designers can use and, and which the audience, you know, may not even be aware of, but they're going to appreciate, you know, this is powerful stuff. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's delightful and it never goes away. So even with my intellectual or academic understanding of music, I continue to experience the emotional magic of it whenever I sit down into it. You know, it's super powerful stuff. The, the language of audio and the sort of emotional experience of audio, because it's kind of not something you can see and don't necessarily think about like in the front of your brain, in the theater and video in, and picture world and like sort of the film and theater world, it has more of a magical quality than uh, uh, costumes or sets that you're seeing. And somehow seeing is a little more intellect. I think for an audience, seeing is a little more intellectual and hearing the sound and the music is subliminal, if I can use that word. Yep. We got a number of questions, Chris, if you don't mind me throwing some more out here. A number awesome of them. Out. Yep. Another, a lot of them, I should say, had a theme of where you find your inspiration. Uh, here's here's what I actually think. I don't believe in inspiration. So what happens to a creative artist as they create, I guess is kind of the question, right? And I think that there's things that are in common across various disciplines and various artists. And of course, I know a lot. It's a mixture of emotion and reverence of a quiet space and devotion and craft. So if I decide I want something creatively, like, I, like, like if I decide I need to write some music for Cyrano because they're paying me, I like ask for it. And asking for it is hard. It's a, it's a question of quieting things down. And if I quiet things down enough, I get an answer. And if I don't quiet things down, I don't get an answer. And it's a lot like what just happened when you asked that question. First, I made a stupid joke. My brain is noisy. And then I thought a little bit about it. And I quieted myself down and I said, well, how do I actually, what's actually true about this? And the answer is, I don't really believe in inspiration. Of course, the word inspiration means incoming breath, doesn't it? So I suppose in some sense, we're allowing that thing to enter, at least I am. Um, here's the thing that you have to do is feed your brain. You gotta have a deep understanding of what, where what you're doing comes from culturally, historically, technically, and um, to some degree, you know, with intent, right? What's the intent of this as well? So I have an academic background as a musician. I continue to study as a musician. I continue to read. I continue to explore other elements of, you know, our culture in a way that feeds my brain, right? Read the paper, talk to people listen. All those things um, provide a foundation for what actually happens after that breath comes in. Uh, we had some questions about your album, Terrain, and specific. Oh. Uh, Emily asked a question, and, and I believe there were a couple, so forgive me if, if uh, you also asked about this, but about sort of that, that album and how, what, what you believe music plays, uh, the role music plays in practices like restorative yoga and meditation. Here's the thing about music. It's really a, uh, it, you, what you're working with, aside from just the obvious, like weird, like job of sculpting air, is you're working with the cultural expectation fulfillment dyad. 
if I start a sentence, you will expect me to finish it. If, if I start a melody, it has contour which creates an expectation. I may fulfill or fail to fulfill that. And actually, that's the artistic kind of component, right? How do I manage that? Now, meditation music, drone music, music for contemplation and for gentle action um, actually steps back from that expectation fulfillment dyad a bit and simply acts to create a container, a, a sort of a, a strong, grounded space. It's almost like uh, architecture that supports the floor and walls and creates a roof which is going to shelter you in the space that you're in. And that space may be, you know, any number of things. I think one of the questions really interested me because they put their finger on a piece that I really, really like on terrain, which is... Is this the passing overhead? Passing sound? overhead. Yeah. yeah that's you came up. So, so passing overhead um, is, you exactly got it, which just made me so happy. Um, we have this experience all the time, right? You're outside and there goes a helicopter or a plane or a couple of planes and they're tonal like my you know like i said you don't want to be in my head but in my head that's super loud nobody else is hearing that except me i go like there's a fifth ten thousand feet in the air above me you know there's <laughs> you know i hear a chord up in the sky right and 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 that can be like weirdly like paranoid almost but my effort was to transform that into something which you know felt grounded and 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 th and that question made me just very very delighted and you know i'm not the only composer who does things like that the the um the theoretician and composer of the famous composer of the 60s 70s and 80s and a man who's a hero of mine john cage rather famously did a piece for the choreographer merce cunningham that used nothing but car alarms and the rationale for that was, I hate car alarms. So I'm going to bring them in. Um, that made her wonder whether emotion is the driving force of your work and what factors correspond to different emotions within a sound. Two driving forces in my work, definitely emotion. And second of all, narrative. And those two things meet in what? Character. Character. So even for instrumental music, it's certainly true in songs, character is the thing. When I, you know, I'm, I love old movies and I love theater. And the reason I love stories is character. Character is like the, character is this, the heart of everything. I, I read, where did, I, wish, I can't, I'm not going to do a good job repeating this quotation, but, um, plot is the ugly bucket that contains the really good stuff, which is character. Chris, we had, and we only have a few questions or minutes left, but uh, a wow. lot of questions, not any specifically uh, asked about what, I see you have an accordion in the background there. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. What is your, do you have a favorite instrument and why? Uh, the voice, for sure. I mean, the voice is the primary instrument uh, culturally across the globe, and it's the first instrument in um you know like sort of history right and after that of course it's the bones of your enemies and <laughs> and 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 then um and and then everything else you know <laughs> got it in that order in that order yeah bones of your enemies got it thank you for doing this with us today because i um our department, sadly, uh, we have all these areas represented. We have scenic design, costume design, lighting design. We've heard from those to this year already in this class, but but no one here teaches in our department at least uh, composition and sound design. So we're very very grateful to you for spending an hour with us and, um, and and letting us into your world. If you don't already follow Chris Houston's YouTube page, do it. Uh, Chris, with that in mind, we have some students uh, and a few in this room I know who really kind of get excited about this kind of artistry. Um, what do you recommend they do? Could they follow up with further questions to you directly or, or what do you follow your YouTube page, of course? Anything else, any advice for them? 
Well, first of all, I do, I'll welcome uh, any, you know, specific inquiries or even just, you know, general support around questions. And, and, and I, 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 I guess I'm going to just reiterate that if they're very interested, subscribing to the YouTube channel it is, um, I think it's particularly useful if you're interested in, in music and, and the kinds of music that we're making now for, um, you know, games and video and to perhaps to some degree theater. If you're genuinely interested in theater sound design, then you've got to get a copy of, <laughs> of uh, you know, QLab onto your laptop and just start mucking about with it. And I, I'll just say this. I think it, sound design is essentially a question of awareness to us, to an invisible world. And in order to encourage yourself to be aware and kind of constantly monitoring your own reaction to that invisible world is a kind of a tricky challenge. But if you can put that challenge to yourself somehow, perhaps it's by, you know, just a bracelet or, of something that reminds you or a pin that you always wear or a tattoo, the <laughs> just that reminder to be aware of it is going to begin to enliven, you know, your thinking about it. Um, daily practice of anything is the path, right? So uh, I know that there are many demands on your time, but if you're genuinely interested in it, make a little space every day to explore it. Uh, Chris, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today. And, uh, and uh, we'll see you all Thursday. All right, thank you, Chris. Thanks, bye everyone. Bye-bye.